is Chad Thackeray here, uh, our next speaker. All right, here he is. Very cool. All right, so I interviewed him as well. I mean, most of these people have been interviewed already on Monero Talk. Uh, this was also one of our most viewed, uh, recently most viewed videos. People are interested in this, uh, Chad. So this is going to be more, more price talk. And like I said, I, li I like price talk. I like hearing about it. And Chad does it in a very um, object seemingly objective way. So go for it, man. All right. Uh, are we all? Yeah. Okay. So I'm going to be talking basically about price in general and like why we should actually care about price. I think there's often a instinctive reaction uh, to kind of dismiss any talk uh, about price, about, about price targets, about whether it goes up or down. And I'm not sure that's, the, that's ultimately the right attitude at the end of the day. Um, so if you go to the next slide. So a little bit about me. I started out as a mathematician, so there might be a bit of jargon in here. If you don't get it, just yell at me or something. I'll sort it out. Um, I then went into sort of you know banking, software development, that kind of thing. And these days, I run a YouTube channel on algo trading and just how to do stuff in Python. So you can check that out if you're a programmer, you want to learn about that kind of stuff. Uh, next slide, please. So yeah, my motivation for writing this talk is that price is seen as a dirty word, basically. It's, um, you know, it's something we don't talk about. It's, uh, it's pushed to the side. Um, yeah, um, it's seen as like a, yeah, that's something we don't talk about. We only talk about the, the pure tech. Um, whereas I, I'm gonna put forward the proposition that ultimately uh, price is actually important. Um, and yeah, I'm gonna lay that out. Um, there's, there's often the common viewpoint that Monero works just as well at like a low dollar amount, like one dollar, than it does at a thousand dollars. And I'm not entirely, I'm not entirely convinced about that. Uh, so I'm gonna go through that as well. And next slide, please. So two basic prong approach here. Yeah? Uh, the first one, we're just gonna talk about why, why, why do we care about price? Why is price important? Uh, we can talk about number of technology and that kind of thing. And then in the second half, we're going to mostly be talking about some data science models that try to look at the growth of the price so far, model it, and just see what we can learn from that. So we'll be getting to those charts later on, but for now, we'll just talk about why we actually care. Next slide, please. So there are three main things that we care about in terms of price. Uh, the first one probably being liquidity, pretty important. Um, if you know if the, if the market cap isn't sufficient, you're not going to be able to quickly get in and out of the market, especially if you're trading like really large amounts. Um, it's going to be pretty difficult for you to uh, get, get in and out of the market at a reasonable rate without getting absolutely destroyed on the spread. Second factor is security. So I'll go into that, you know, general blockchain security, uh, block reward, that kind of thing. And then the third one is just, I mean, I, I would put forward the proposition that um, the price increase is basically necessary, or at least, you know, a market cap increase, more money in the system is necessary if Monero is going to become a, like a global digital cash. Uh, so next slide, please. So in terms of liquidity, um, you can think about it like this. Uh, if you were to just equally distribute all of the Monero right now, uh, we ignore you know, what would happen in the markets as a result of that. But th there's not enough for everyone on Earth to have like $1 worth. Uh, the market cap's only about $4 billion at the minute. So, you know, that... If everyone on Earth is going to have a Monero wallet and they're going to store their cash like they would in their real wallet, uh, something's got to change, basically. Um, so, yeah. Next slide. So, there's also problems with slippage at the minute. So, I just sort of went logged on to Binance the other day and I looked at how much slippage I would encounter uh, if I were to buy a million dollars worth of Monero, which market buy. 
uh, for Monero, it's like nine, but it was like nine percent at the time I checked it. Whereas for something like Bitcoin, with a bit more, a lot more liquidity in the system, you're only going to lose like 0.1 percent. So again, this is this is only a problem depending on how you see Monero being used. Um, if you think it's just going to be you know, mostly you know small transactions, maybe we're not going to be doing market buying a million dollars. But um, if you see uh, larger companies using it. Uh, it's going to become important that we don't have this this nine percent spread. You know, obviously there are strategies that you can use rather than just market buying to try and reduce that. But uh, it's something worth bearing in mind at least. So next slide. Uh, security is another reason to care about price. The current block reward is about one hundred and fifty dollars. So with seven hundred and twenty blocks per day, that's about a hundred thousand dollars a day, basically of security fees paid to the miners. Now, you can get into lots of discussions about um, ASICs and that kind of thing. Um, but the simplest way to look at it is just look at how much you're actually paying the miners um, and the market will sort out their security. Um, that's roughly analogous to how much uh, Bitcoin was paid out to miners in 2013. So that's roughly roughly where Monero is today. Um, so we're still pretty pretty early, really. Um, there are other options to increase the amount of money that goes to miners. You could, you could increase the block reward directly, but that creates inflation. No one likes inflation. Um, you could also increase fees, but again, the whole point is to have low fees, so we don't want to do that. Therefore, you know, the only realistic approach we have to increase the amount of security by paying more to the miners is for the price to increase. Next slide. Developers are also paid in Monero. So if Monero becomes widely known as um, you know, an asset that's, that's not going anywhere, it's just, just declining, um, you're probably going to have trouble attracting good quality developers. Uh, so that could be a real problem security-wise. And yeah, the price increase, it, it rewards the the people who are committed to privacy and who've been in there the longest. So ultimately, you're giving these people uh, more capital, which they're going to allocate to more privacy-related uh, projects, whether that's Monero directly or something else. Um, number go up also makes it more difficult to delist Monero. Again, whether you care about delisting is... Um, I guess a matter of opinion, but it's only so easy to delist Monero because it makes up such a small amount of the volume. Um, you know, it's, uh, it is less odious for exchanges to delist it than to delist something like Dogecoin. Um, they don't make very much money on it, probably, as comparison to Bitcoin. So with it having such a low market cap and trading volume, Pretty easy for the um, the regulators to come in and the exchanges just rolled over, at least in England, at least where I'm from. So next slide, please. So I hope that I've kind of made the point that uh, a, some kind of price increase uh, is required. It is necessary, but not sufficient for Monero to become a digital cash. And the extent to which you see that basically depends on where you see Monero going. So if you see Monero as just something like a, you know, like a niche thing used by tech enthusiasts, then you can say we're there already. Uh, but if you, if you want to become like a, you know, like a, real, a real digital cash that's used globally, then we've got a fair way to go. We're not going to get there with a $4 billion market cap. So next slide. So we're going to look at a few statistical models here, just of the, like the previous price history in Monero. Um, I just thought I'd put a few clarifiers up here. Again, this is a, a topic that kind of divides people. So some people will imbue magical properties to statistical models that think they can you know, predict the future with them. Uh, some people just dismiss them completely. But I would say it's like a, more of a statistical fact can be useful to inform any and all speculation. Uh, caveat, we have a lot less price data than we do for Bitcoin. So, it, you know, there's less we can do, really. So next slide. 
So thanks to the lovely work of our core developers, uh, we don't have much in the way of on-chain data, uh, but we do have things like transaction volume, which we can use. So this chart, if you can see it, is basically a just a graph of the number of daily transactions. I've smoothed it out a bit, otherwise it would be way too spiky. And basically what we've seen since 2015 is uninterrupted growth, basically. Even during the bear market, there wasn't really a large decrease in the, the volume of transactions, so the actual amount of transactions being used. Uh, we can't get things like the, the actual volume of Monero traded backwards and forwards. We can't get that. But um, as far as the actual, uh, the actual amount of transactions goes, it's pretty much just been up and up since, um, since the beginning, really. And we're currently sitting on like 20,000 transactions a day. So if you go to the next slide, you can get an interesting indicator if you divide the price by the transactions per day. Uh, can give you some sort of idea of whether the rate of increase in the price is outpacing the number of transactions, um, which would probably indicate we're entering more of a speculative territory, so you should you know, be a bit careful maybe. Um, you'll notice that while Monero price is pretty similar to what it was in 2017, um, this indicator is a much lower level, mainly because uh, the, the growth in use, the volume of transactions has increased lockstep with it. So we're basically going sideways, which is more of an indicator of actual organic growth rather than just you know, fervent speculation. The y-axis there is logged, so that's not going to make much sense, but um, yeah, next slide. So you can look at things, you know, if you want to just look at the, the raw price itself, um, try and figure out what's happening. Um, you can try and just fit some kind of curve to it. Uh, if you just look at this graph, you'll see that you know, the, the curve that fits it the best is going to be some kind of logarithmic curve. Uh, the, Price itself is in a log graph, so it's, a, it's like a log chart on a log graph. And what I, what this aims to be is essentially a fair value band. So if you go to the next slide, um, you can see I've just I've basically just selected groups of data that are non speculative in nature. Basically, there wasn't too much happening during that time. Uh, although obviously that is basically an arbitrary choice by me there. So you get different results if you pick different things. And what that is aiming to do is provide some sort of you know, some sort of idea of the um, like the base market value of Monero, like a fair value band that um, you could be justified in. Um, you're not buying into the FOMO or the speculative fever. Um, so if we go to the next one. I just put some numbers on there just for context. So that's out at 2025. Um, if this log regression were to hold, you know, you'd be expecting somewhere in the region of $400 to $1,000, which is a big range, but that's what you get. You know, you, you're not going to find any statistical model that's going to tell you the exact price to four significant figures. Um, but I guess, that, you know, we do have to be careful with these kind of models. So if you go to the next slide. Uh, this is a, a map, uh, this is a, a graph of the, the German gold mark versus the paper mark, so versus the fiat currency that they implemented. And you can't see the bottom there, but if we were in maybe like 1921 or something, um, just sort of near the bottom of that graph, we might uh, plot a log regression against that, like I just did there, and I think we were good. Um, obviously, things didn't work out quite that way. Um, we ended up with hyperinflation, obviously. Um, so yeah, that, that is one flaw of the, the log regression model is that it doesn't take into account inflation, which can lead to events like this one. So next slide, please. Um, another take on the sort of log regression view of things is, so you take the, the y-axis is, uh, you take the log of it. So you end up with like a log price graph. Uh, but an interesting twist is to, on the x-axis, you take the number of days since the Genesis block or you know, however far away you can find price data for. 
Uh, and you take the log of that. So basically, the years get closer and closer and closer together uh, as you go further and further on. Um, and we end up with basically a linear fit here. Now, you could argue it's a bit tenuous, but um, we have a sort of a straight line up and to the right here, um, indicating that there's some positive uh, linear correlation um, on like when you when you scale the graph like this. Um, again, we don't have as much data with Monero as we had for Bitcoin. With Bitcoin, this graph works very nicely. Um, there's a Medium article by Harold Christopher Berger. Uh, it's called like the the Bitcoin Power Law Corridor of Growth. If you're interested in figuring out how this graph works, um, but if you go to the next one, you can basically shift that line upwards and downwards to get some sort of support and resistance regions, basically. Um, just trying to establish a, a playground in which Monero plays. You know, you, again, you're not going to be able to figure out the you know, the exact price that Monero is going to be on next Tuesday. Uh, but all we aim to do is to figure out, are we in a speculative mania and therefore I should be careful? Or actually, is the market a bit cooler and therefore I, I feel more comfortable about adding? And pretty much everything I've shown you so far has shown that we're, we're close to fair value, basically, at the minute. So go to the next slide. You can take um, the distance between that uh, the linear regression, so between that straight fit line, and plot that out. So basically, if we have a positive value, we're above that fair value line uh, that was plotted by a linear regression. Alternatively, if we're below that, we have a negative value, then we're below the line. Um, this has log distance, so the value of 1.5 there is, is quite some way. It's like, a, like an order of magnitude, like a 10x greater than the actual line value. Um, this is nice if you like, if you like oscillators. You basically want to you know, figure out um, where we are, whether we're overpriced or underpriced. Um, and so I think that's I think that's basically all I've got. I think the next one, the next slide should be just questions. Yeah. So that was fairly speedy, but we are running behind. So any questions, anyone? Um, is there a better way to do this other than me? <laughs> do you want to just shout? Not really, to be honest. Um, that's probably something interesting to do uh, if you want to. <laughs> um, Oh yeah, 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 yeah. Um, I guess yeah. If you compare against Bitcoin, you're getting a more like pure measure because the dollar supply is being messed around all the time. Um, so yeah, you could pretty much just um, it wouldn't be difficult to plug in the uh, the Bitcoin value to some of those models and see what happens. Uh, the code will be on my my GitHub if you if you find me afterwards, I can send you it. Anything else? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So everything I've shown you so far, uh, I think I think it basically suggests that we're at sort of like a we're, we're at a fair value stage. Um, I don't think there's as in I don't think there's much downside as in I think the downside is like limited at like 50%. I don't think we're going to see another, well, an 80% correction from here, um, at least according to what I've seen so far. Um, are we in a bull market? I would say, I mean, if we were in any other asset class, we would say we're in a bull market. We've done pretty well over the last couple of years. Um, 
all time highs end of this year. I don't know. Um, I just sort of think, you know, um, where are we going to be in 10 years? That's, that's, yeah. <laughs> I think trying, if, if you give birth a price target and a time, you're almost guaranteed to be wrong. <laughs> so you give one or the other. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? All right. Well, thank you.